Warning, the following word is fuck. See, I told you. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by Honey, Adam and Eve, and by Puzzle and a Thunderstorm brand Atheist Indulgences. With just one Atheist Indulgence, you get to sin as much as you want without going to hell. No purchase necessary. And now, The Scathing Atheist. Hello, I am Quinn from the Discord in a Thunderstorm unofficial fan server. And if, like us, you do know that we did in fact evolve from filthy monkey men, please join us. Day. It's March 31st. And it's Terry's Day. Huh. Yeah, because Christians are literally only pro life when it means anti choice. Right? Fun. <laughs> I'm No Illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And from Snooky's, New Jersey, Ann Arbor, <laughs> Michigan, and Waycross, Georgia, this is The Scathing Atheist. On this week's episode, Lindsey Graham fails his own pop quiz. <laughs> he does. <laughs> we learn that health and happiness are apparently anti Semitic. And Don Ford will do enough voices for it to sound like we have a bunch of friends. But first, the diatribe. In a 1999 address at the American Association for the Advancement of Science in Washington, D.C., American physicist and Nobel laureate Steven Weinberg famously said, quote, Religion is an insult to human dignity. With or without it, you would have good people doing good things and evil people doing evil things. But for good people to do evil things, that takes religion, end quote. Now, that's one of those quotes that atheists tend to love when they're new to atheism and tend to kind of hate once they've been here for a while. I, it's problematic, of course, because it's so effortlessly refutable. It simply isn't true. Great religion is just one of the many forms of lying that can have that effect. Political ideology, bigoted propaganda, garden variety deception. Those can all be used to push a good person over the line into an immoral act. So the absolute nature of the quote becomes ready fodder for the religious apologist. That being said, that refutes the quote, not the point. I mean, you can back way off the absolutism and it's still saying something pretty damnable about religion. And I mean, yes, Weinberg does over the state the case, but in a very real sense, he also kind of understates the case. I mean, the, the dichotomy between good people and evil people is obviously problematic by itself. We're not a fucking George Lucas movie, but, but we have to remember that religion is just as good at making bad people worse as it is at making good people bad. That may not seem like an important point to make, but I'd argue that it is. See, when we think of religion making a good person do a bad thing, we normally think of it as a tool, right? Like somebody would be using the religion to manipulate a person into doing something that might otherwise violate their sense of morality. And while that certainly does happen, and while religion is a super useful tool for doing exactly that, that isn't the only way it makes people worse. Unlike most tools, religion doesn't need anyone to wield it. Its evil-making effects can work even when the damn thing is sitting on a shelf. Take, for example, the text messages recently released by the January 6th committee between Ginny Thomas and Mark Meadows. So, to clarify for foreign listeners and people blissfully unplugged from the news cycles, these are texts that were sent to Donald Trump's chief of staff by the wife of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas in the wake of the 2020 election. And the overriding theme of the messages was, you need to overthrow the democratic process and install Trump as a god king, complete with sources that Alex Jones would be embarrassed to cite. It's as ridiculous as it is terrifying. But the one thing that stands out the most to an atheist like myself is the way that every push towards insurrection was bedecked with religious language. Their entire conversation is loaded with allusions to the apocalypse in reference to the king of kings triumphing over, you know, the will of the American people. Now, clearly nobody would accuse Mark Meadows or Ginny Thomas of being good people. They would no doubt be doing evil things regardless of religion's influence. And there was no like nefarious puppeteer pulling their strings here. I mean, there kind of was in the form of Trump. But the key is that like they 
were the nefarious puppeteers in this situation. They were manipulating themselves and one another into doing a thing that they were already actively doing. But religion's convenient proximity no doubt provided an ethical bomb that both of them needed. Even the worst of us know that a coup against a democratically elected government is a bad thing. But that's no problem if you remind yourself that the only vote that really counts belongs to Jesus. And throughout those texts, you would see claims about Christ's role in electing Donald Trump conspicuously following any hints of insurrection. Of course, the overtly religious nature of their justifications caused many would-be apologists in the media to take umbrage on behalf of the King of Kings. Right, Joe Scarborough notably devoted several minutes to how offended he was that somebody would dare to invoke the name of Christ the Savior in their effort to overthrow the government. Like as though they didn't storm the Capitol carrying Christian signs, wearing Christian garb, chanting Christian slogans, waving Christian flags, and saying Christian fucking prayers. See, the most terrifying thing about religion isn't that it encourages people to do evil acts, it's that it blinds people to evil acts. Even now, with an avalanche of evidence that Christian nationalism is the greatest threat to our country, the overwhelming majority are still constantly surprised every time they're forced to reckon with that fact. We've spent way too long equating church attendance with morality and Christianity with goodness, such that no matter how much evidence shows us the opposite is true, we can't fucking see it. I mean, I mean, one half of America's political system either suffers from apocalyptic delusions or is beholden to people who suffer from apocalyptic delusions. The fact that our foreign policy is, at least to some degree, dictated by the fact that Christians think the Jews have to be in charge of Israel for the world to end correctly should be the most terrifying thing any of us knows. But America has a blind spot, a religion-shaped hole in its head, if you will. And so we treat policies informed by a literal belief in the biblical apocalypse as, at best, quaint. So yeah, Steven Weinberg was wrong. Religion was so much worse than he was giving it credit for. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight are the ugh and wrong way to Mike Coyley, Heath Enright, and Eli Bosnick. <laughs> Fellas, are you ready to hop to it? <laughs> Love Qbert. Such a good game. I was going to say, fun fact, if you got that joke, you need glasses to text. Okay. <laughs> I do talk to text. <laughs> Quick while I squint at my phone long enough to disprove Eli's point, we're going to pause for a word from our first sponsor this week, Honey. Hey, guys. Don Ford, voice of fantasy scene and adventure. What are you doing here? Yeah, man. You're not supposed to show up until Bible Peace Theater. Oh, he told me to show up early. He gave me all the. That's right. I did because I wrote the ads this week. Oh, oh right on. Uh, Eli usually writes the ads. Yeah. Yeah, he, he does. And he, he makes me look dumb or like play coupon Craig, who's very problematic. So this week I wrote him. OK, man. Yeah, I guess, I guess if it's important to you, we can. Um, Great. Do your. Great, right, right. So here's the scripts. Did you. Did you handwrite these? Yes, I did. You're welcome. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Hey, Heath. Up, 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 up. Wait for action, please. Why would we call action? We're not like... We're calling action and... Action. Hey, Heath. What are you doing? Oh, I was just composing this sonnet with my good friend Don Ford, voice of Fantasy Adventure. Yes, we are friends. Good friends. Yes, we are. So what do you want? I want to introduce you to my friend, stupid coupon idiot, Steve. Seriously? Read the lines. Read the lines. Just read them. My name is Stupid Coupon Idiot Steve. Oh, no. My coupons expired and I fell into a bag of sand. What? I fell into a bag. <laughs> I disarm you of your sword now. Why do I have a sword? You should have tried honey. I did try, darling. Kiss me, you madman. <laughs> Man, Heath, you look like a good kisser. <laughs> I, <clears throat> I am a good kisser. Yes. Yes. Honey is the free shopping tool that scours the internet for promo codes and applies the best one it finds to your cart. How does it work? Puns are brilliant wordplay, and those who speak against them are jealous. Jealous people, correct. Imagine you're shopping on one of your favorite sites. When you check out, the Honey button appears, and all you have to do is click Apply Coupons. Wait a few seconds as Honey searches for coupons it can find for that site, and if Honey finds a working coupon, you'll watch the prices drop. And Honey doesn't just work on desktop. It works on your iPhone, too. Just activate it on Safari on your phone and save on the go. Don, never speak unless spoken to, you beautiful, wet angel. But yes, yes, what you said is true. And they won't sell my data? Oh, no. 
My finger got stuck up my nose. Seriously? My <laughs> finger? <laughs> no, you fool. They don't. If you don't already have honey, you could be straight up missing out. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting this show. I'd never recommend something I don't use. Get honey for free at joinhoney.com slash scathing. That's joinhoney.com slash scathing. Honey, if you'd like your money back for this one, you just you let us know. We were just trying a, a thing. They're going to love this. Okay. And now, back to the headlines. In our lead story tonight, in Too Brown for the Bench News, if you listen to our sister show, The Skeptocrat, you know that we covered last week's, shall we say, farcical confirmation hearings of future Supreme Court Justice Kentanji Brown-Jackson. And while I'd love to reiterate the deep and abiding stupidity of so many Republican questions at those hearings <laughs> over here at The Scathing Atheist, <laughs> there's one line of questioning I'd like to talk about in particular here. And that would be Lindsey Graham's attempted gotcha when it came to her faith. Oh, my God. It's nice to see that Lindsey Graham can make an ass out of himself at confirmation hearings in a bipartisan way, right? <laughs> he sure can. <laughs> yeah. And he stormed out at one point. Oh, best. so good. See, like every other unrelated and unhinged rant during the confirmations hearing, the platonic Graham Cracker <laughs> was trying to make an unrelated point. In this case, the treatment of Justice Amy Coney Barrett during her confirmation hearings. Now, Barrett is part of a too crazy for the Catholic Church cult, which, among other things, speaks in tongues and refers to some of its female members as handmaidens. And during her confirmation hearing, Democrats had the gall to mention mm -hmm. that. Yep. So Graham decided to get his revenge by proving how sane by comparison Brown Jackson was compared to Barrett. Yes. Right. The, the, the point he literally ended up making was we can do the same thing we falsely accused y'all of doing. <laughs> right. <laughs> Noah, you mind reenacting this dialogue with me? I'll, I'll be Graham. You be Jackson. And Heath, do you mind being her inner monologue here? Oh, there Ooh. you go. Okay. Katanji yeah. Brown Jackson's inner All monologue. Right. <clears throat> All right. Let's see if I still have my Lindsey Graham. What faith are you, by the way? I hate you so much. Senator, I am, um, Protestant. Mm, okay. Non-denominational. You fucking juice box of a human being. Okay, uh, could you fairly judge a Catholic? Senator, I have a record of judging everyone. I'm just asking the question because how important is your faith to you? Oh, fuck. I'm basically an atheist because I can read. What do I say here? Senator, personally, my faith is very important. But as you know, there's no religious test in the Constitution under Article 6. And, and there will be none with me. Cool. You literally just provided one during a congressional hearing. And it's very important to set aside one's personal views about things in the role of a judge. I couldn't agree with you more. And I believe you can. So on a scale of 1 to 10, how faithful would you say you are in terms of religion? Can he hear him speaking? You know, I, I go to church probably three times a year, so that speaks poorly of me. Or do you attend church regularly? That's literally the thing that speaks best of you, for sure. Well, Senator, I am reluctant to talk about my faith in this way because I want to be mindful of the need for the public to have confidence in my ability to separate out my personal views. You look like Peppa Pig got punched in the face. <laughs> <laughs> and seen. Exactly. <laughs> He does look like that. <laughs> he does. He does look a lot like that. <laughs> <laughs> so after this exchange, Graham went on to explain his bit like a racist slowly backing out of a bar. Yeah. But the opposite point than the one he wanted had been made, right? Katanji Brown Jackson is qualified to sit on the court precisely because she's able to separate her legal opinions from her faith, if she has any. Wish the same could be said for our senators, but, you know, yeah. it's 2022. I'll take the Supreme Court seat for now and count my blessings. Yeah, right. Amy Coney Barrett literally wrote an essay that said a Catholic judge couldn't do their job because they would have yes. to recuse yeah. themselves from a bunch of right. stuff like about capital punishment. They were quoting her when they talked about the Yes. <laughs> it's just relevant. So by definition with her case. Also, she's evil. Like That's you're the it. bad guys. You're the fucking bad guys. That's also the difference. <laughs> Fuck you. And in... Haretz, do the time warp again. Fantastic. <laughs> Don't you be ashamed of that. Either. <laughs> Don't you be ashamed of that. Say ha it loud. Say it proud. Haretz is the land of Israel, I believe, translated. This is about some Jewish stuff and some time stuff. And that all made sense. So the U.S. Senate recently passed the Sunshine Protection Act, which would put us on daylight savings time permanently starting in March of next year. 
But many of the more observant Jewish communities of America have a big problem with that because it fucks up their morning magic routine. And uh, that's not a like, morning magic routine. That's not like coffee with butter and a quick hege like everybody else. It's a praying routine that happens right after sunrise. It has to happen right after sunrise. So it's going to get bumped up by an hour in the winter, and that's going to conflict with r- real stuff like jobs. Right. right, which conservative Jews are so well known for having <laughs> <laughs> all those orthodox guys you see working at McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I love that our solution to daylight savings time is stupid, though, isn't to get rid of it. It's like it's like we have to do at least half stupid as a compromise or something. <laughs> it is America. Yeah. So according to the Jewish magical spell book, there's a set of prayers that has to happen after sunrise. And with permanent daylight savings time, if you're all the way in the northwest corner of your time zone, sunrise during most of the winter is going to happen later than 8 a.m. and sometimes even later than 9 a.m. For all the all the Orthodox Jewish people in Alaska, it'll be after 10 a.m. at its latest moment. <laughs> and for certain types of magic, you have to get together with a quorum of at least 10 people and recite the spell communally, which takes about 30 to 40 minutes every morning. And based on a photo from the article on religionnews.com that I saw, this magic thing also involves a, a smock with plenty of yarn handles, at least two very large rolling pins, some leather bondage nunchucks. I think Mm -hmm. they're called to fill in. Yep. And a guy wearing dress pants with the, I'm pretty sure exact same Velcro sneakers as Eli (laughs) Boss. Yeah. I don't know how religion news got my bar mitzvah photos, but you will be hearing from my lawyers, (laughs) sirs. Well, it'll be to apologize for a flaming bag of poop or something, but yes, you will hear. from. (laughs) So in response to the new bill, the vice president of government affairs for Agadath Israel of America, his name's Rabbi Abba Cohen, he issued a statement explaining the problem for him. Lots of Jewish people wouldn't be able to do their magic and still get to work on time in the winter. Well, Congress is in charge of scheduling, and they already kind of posted the new time system after it got passed in the Senate. But according to Rabbi Cohen, they could fucking unpost it, despite plenty of data that shows the new time system is going to make the country healthier, happier, and very literally prevent death. Like a good amount of death will be prevented on top of those other advantages. Cohen and a handful of other Jewish leaders want to get the bill canceled before it gets passed by the House and signed into law. Yeah. Are they planning to take the how much America cares about Jews angle or the how easy it is to change politicians' minds once they're made up? (laughs) Tricky. (laughs) Try, Try both. See what happens. So I'm pretty sure there's a solution here. That's the thing. Um, The solution would be we do the daylight savings time <laughs> and go fuck yourself. But the point is, there's already an existing way to deal with it when a religion thing happens during the work day. Like on Friday afternoon, for example, lots of Jewish employees are allowed to leave work early before sundown because so- something with sundown magic happens. And if they need to make up those hours somehow, they do it when there's not a sun-based magical event. And it's fine. There you go. Yeah. I mean, if the guy at my halal cart can fucking duck out for carpet prayers nine times a day or whatever. I feel like you guys can do bagels and God chat in the break room. Like, right. <laughs> what's going on, people? Well, I mean, and given like the fucking penis mutilation, the silly hats, all that stuff, Judaism kind of needs a few more fringe benefits, right? Coming in at 930 in the morning. Like, it's, it's just, just for recruiting purposes, right? Sure. Get to skip homeroom. Yeah. It's a positive. Just think it through. So just to recap, though, on one side, we have life, health, and happiness statistically across the entire society. And on the other side, religion. Yep. And I could be talking about any story we've ever done on this show. <laughs> <laughs> if you've ever decides to mail it in, that's why yeah, that's just the generic say that over headline and over again. Goes, there you go. right. <laughs> and in cross the fi- speaking of which, in cross the finish line news tonight. A court in Finland is set to decide whether the Bible can exonerate a person from hate speech laws. And for obvious reasons, Christians are nervous as all fuck about it. The case centers around a pamphlet called Male and Female He Created Them, which the nation's prosecutor general says is, quote, likely to cause intolerance, contempt and hatred towards homosexuals, end quote. And in an admission that they seem to think is a defense, Christians are pointing out that the same could be said of the very Bible itself. Hmm. Wait, Yeah. why are you writing that down? Don't write that down. (laughs) (laughs) No, you can't do that. You'd be making Christianity illegal. Making Christianity 
<laughs> stop, stop it. Stop. I see you're still writing. So the defendants here are the pamphlet's author, who served as the nation's interior ministry as recently as 2015, as well as the Lutheran bishop who published it. Now, the woman has three fucking umlauts in her name. There's no way I'm getting it right, but it looks like <laughs> Paivi Rossinen. And while you could argue that the pamphlet doesn't actually call for violence, actually would be doing a lot of work when you sure did. would. Or actually. <laughs> it does point out, of course, that Mosaic law calls for gay people to be put to death and doesn't make any efforts to, like, back away from that. It also says that gayness is a mental disorder, advocates for conversion therapy, says that societal acceptance of LGBTQ partnerships empowers pedophiles and claims fuck? that it will inevitably lead to the downfall of civilization itself. Oh, so I call you a pedophile societal enemy and you can just start throwing around the B word? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> We're literally the happiest country in the world and we mostly got rid of religious assholes like you. I feel like it has to be causality too, right? It's got right. it's got to be both. So I, I should be clear about the controversy here because Americans tend to look at free speech as a sacrosanct thing. And I'm sure a lot of our listeners would just take issue with criminally charging this lady at all. You're wrong, by the way. Just real okay, quick, those right. listening. But but <laughs> that's just the law in Finland, right? That's how it is. And near as I can tell, and to be clear, I'm not an expert on this thing to at least the third power, but there's no real question here that her pamphlet violates Finnish hate crime laws. What the court is trying to decide here is whether it should still count, even if she sincerely believes that God has called us to murder the gay people. And if there's any doubt about who's the bad guy here, by the way, I should also point out that she's being represented by the Alliance Defending Freedom International. Yikes. They had to call in hate group pinch hitter <laughs> from America. Yeah. yeah. Finland literally did not have a local boy to represent this level of stupid. Because <laughs> right, they're the happiest country. Oh, but this is like the American dad in the 80s who's the soccer coach somehow finding the one like South American kid within a hundred miles of his shitty suburb to be the ringer on the youth soccer team. Jesus. But for hate crimes. But for hate crimes. Yeah, yeah, but exactly. for hate crimes. Sometimes that's redundant, but like you use you, you yeah, Well, true, yeah. Of course, defenders of Rossinen's bigotry are calling the case, quote, a canary in the coal mine for freedom of speech throughout the Western world, end quote. And a columnist in the American Spectator subtitled his story about it, quote, this is what America will soon become if Biden gets his way, end quote. And exponentially an expert as I may be, I can very much assure you that it is neither of those. Nope. Right. Her trial actually wrapped up in the middle of last month, and we're expecting a verdict any day now. Of course, regardless of which way this shakes out, Christian commentators will use it to bolster their hollow cries of persecution for years to come. So I figure we should arm you with the basics, at least. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, they were going to do that with or without this case. But if you want to learn some Finnish names, go nuts. Yeah, tell me how <laughs> Rossinen is pronounced. That'd be awesome. And unless I have to pronounce any more of those names, we're going to take a quick break for a word from our second sponsor this week, Adam and Eve. No, dude, you are absolutely not writing an ad again. What? People love that. This episode hasn't come out yet, Heath. Well, they're going to love it. You'll see. People are going to talk about it. There's going to be well, I have no doubt that they will talk. I'm going to um, talk about it. Excuse me. Uh, uh, could I take a crack at the next one, maybe? Yes, done. Perfect. Yeah. Have I done. write What's the ad. Done? What is happening? I mean, we might as well. We, we let Heath write one. Oh, oh, so just everyone writes ads now. Hey, hey, Don, do you want to do a diatribe this week, too? I mean, I would love to. Don, I'll stab you in the heart. Just an ad will be fine. Fine. Whatever. Go ahead. Do your ad. Hi, I'm Don Ford, voice of fantasy and adventure. You know, aside from the dozens of characters I'm known for creating on this show. You're like three voices from The Simpsons. Dude. I'm also an expert on love, self-love, love for others. And that's why I'm happy to recommend AdamandEve.com. What's AdamandEve.com? Well... If it isn't my good friend, Green Scottish Ogre. Well, Green Scottish Ogre, Adam and Eve is the number one adult toy superstore. And right now, they're offering 50% off almost any one item when you enter code SCATHING at checkout. 50%? Why, with that kind of discount, we could take over the world. Two decades old, Don. That character that is, is two currently old. streaming. But that's not all. When you get one item, they will also send three bonus sexy items and six free movies. Six free movies? That's such a good deal. It's evil. That's right, beloved monkey from the cartoon about girls with power and puff. 
That's adamandeve.com. This is exclusive offer specific to this podcast, so be sure to use this code SCATHING to get you not just the discount and the free goodies, but also the 100% free shipping. Code SCATHING. Well, what do you think? Hated Loved it. it. So good, Don. Eli only gets to do a diatribe when I'm sick, Don, and I feel fine right now. Okay. Okay. A man wrote the Bible. A whore is what she wants. If it's a legitimate rape. It makes you a slut, right? It, cooking can be fun. Hey! I'm proud of a man. This week in Misogyny. As a movement, atheism is often criticized for being overwhelmingly white and male. Now, as we learned from a study a couple weeks ago, part of the problem is that women and minorities are significantly more likely to think that they have to hide their disbelief. But a lot of the problem isn't that, too. And that's why it's so important that in addition to looking at the atheist experience, we look at the female atheist experience, the Hispanic atheist experience, the trans atheist experience, etc., And as a longtime advocate of doing exactly that, I want to applaud American Atheists for the recently released survey on non-religious women. It's a 23-page document that's available for free online. We'll have it linked in the show notes. And it parses the data from the big secular survey they did a couple years back to look specifically at the issues that face women in atheism. It's a really interesting read. Among their findings was a much higher instance of loneliness and depression, higher levels of discrimination, and as I already mentioned, they're way more likely to conceal their religious identity. Now, obviously, I don't have time to go over the entire survey, but it's worth reading. It even has a pretty extensive section on ways to help bring more women into atheism and more atheist women into activism, which we really need. And regardless of what does or doesn't come from it, I think American atheists need some kudos for helping to fill the data gap and show us where we could be doing better. Of course, if you want to feel better about the many ways the atheist community fails women, you could always take the briefest of glances at the other side and see how much better we're doing. Take, for example, Lieutenant Governor of North Carolina, Mark Robinson. Yeah, no, the ultra-Christian who called transgendered people filth and demonic and repeatedly claimed that straight couples are superior to gay ones. Yeah, well, to nobody's surprise, he's also a huge misogynist who talks on and on about the sanctity of life when it comes time to legislate women's bodies. Mm, Not so much, though, when it affects him personally. See, we learned this week that back in 1989, Mr. Sanctity of Life paid for an abortion. Well, to be fair, the sourcing on it is a little sketchy because we learned it from him. Somebody went digging through his old Facebook post and found a conversation about abortion from back in 2012 where he freely admitted it. Of course, nobody in the North Carolina GOP wants to comment on it because what the fuck would they say? But even their excuse not to talk about it betrays a lot. They're saying it would be inappropriate to comment on someone else's personal medical choices. So, you know, okay to legislate on, but not to comment on. See, that's the thing about these assholes. Even when they eventually get it right, they manage to get it wrong. That's the case in our last story this week as well. Now, we haven't talked a hell of a lot about the Brian Houston thing, but suffice it to say he's a mega preacher that got ousted from his church after years of complaints of sexual misconduct around women. Well, on Friday, the church released a statement admitting that there were even more accusations than we knew about, and then they tried to blame his behavior on his sleeping pills. Because you know how some medications have the little label that says send unsolicited sex-based texts to your employees as a side effect? Yeah, it's like that. Anyway, the point is, as the atheist community strives to be ever more welcoming and understanding of women and their unique issues, the other guys are doing whatever the opposite of that is. And on that lovely reminder, I'll hand things back over to Noah, Heath, and Eli. Thank you, Lucinda. And in Foster's Tomb for Imaginary Friends News, former Mississippi lawmaker, former gubernatorial candidate, and Kenneth Parcell's fat older brother, Robert Foster, decided to tweet the quiet part out loud this week, admitting that he'd like all the supporters of trans rights executed via firing squad, saying, quote, Some of y'all still want to try and find political compromise with those that want to groom our school-aged children and pretend men are women, etc., I think they need to be lined up against wall before a firing squad to be sent to an early judgment, 
and actual fucking tweet by a gubernatorial candidate who received 67,000 votes in 2019. Yeah, I, I mean, look, he, he did pull forth behind undecided in that primary, but still, <laughs> these guys keep showing up at your barbecue. Invited or not, you got to start wondering what the <laughs> fuck you're doing wrong with this barbecue, no? It might be a quick hint. It's the Confederate flags at your barbecue. Yeah, well, right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the neo-Nazi platform at your barbecue fucking weird barbecue yeah, and ron DeSantis is a neo-nazi and he's at the podium of your fucking barbecue <laughs> that, that, that helps yeah. yeah yeah so when reached for comment by the mississippi free press foster unsurprisingly doubled down saying quote i said what i said the law should be changed so that anyone trying to sexually groom children and or advocating to put men pretending to be women in locker rooms and bathrooms with young women should receive the death penalty by firing squad end quote Okay, okay, but in reality, it's the transphobes pretending that men are women and pretending women are men. So sure I, I, I have this sort of pipe dream poetic justice thing where he actually does get this law changed and then they immediately give him a cigarette and a blindfold. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, yeah, it backfired. Pepperoni and cheese. <laughs> <laughs> That's an amazing one person remembers that Tombstone pizza commercial. Yes. Or maybe three. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. You're going to get it. And in anti-Semite as well news tonight, former news correspondent and current Fox correspondent Laura Logan bolstered the already <laughs> impressive list of conspiracy promotion subheadings on her Wikipedia article this week. There's a lot. And an anti-Semitic <laughs> one at that that she added. It, it came during an appearance on a QAnon promoting podcast deceptively titled And We Know, where Logan explained. <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> right? Yeah. And on that show, she explained the secret Jewish origins of the theory of evolution. Are they secret? Yeah. According to <laughs> unnamed anal sources, Darwin was actually paid off by the Rothschilds <laughs> to come up with a theory that would discredit Christianity. I mean, and, and Judaism is very and Judaism, confusing yeah. <laughs> long game that they had going there. <laughs> yeah. It's a little confusing there with the, the Darwin part and, you know, discrediting both those religions, including the one the Rothschilds are part of. But. Uh, but then it's like it's 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 the, that evolution something something space lasers wildfires in California yep. profit mm -hmm. yeah, yeah like exactly. the, the end right. part makes sense because they, they they make money no I get it because if your whole thing is exterminating Jews survival of the fittest is a pretty personal insult oh, wow. right <laughs> <laughs> also unnamed anal sources is Eli's Rush cover band oh, oh yeah oh fantastic. So, yeah, here's the rambly ass nonsense in question, complete with the fist fight that she is obviously in with the English language throughout. <laughs> right. It's it's like the words <laughs> in her head knew what she was trying to use them for and started trying to back <laughs> up in line or something. Her words rejecting her like an organ. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Quote. I mean, when I found out, does anybody know when, who employed Darwin? What? Where Darwinism comes from? Well, I mean, you know, look it up. The Rothschilds. Don't look it up. It goes back to 10 Downing Street and the same people who employed Darwin. And that's when Darwin, you know, wrote his theory of evolution and so on and so on. And I'm not saying that none of that is true. I'm just saying Darwin was hired by someone to come up with the theory, right? Based on evidence, okay, fine. End quote. No, I, I know what? that hell doesn't exist, but if it did, it was you reading that sentence. So I'd like to thank you for your service. I'm saluting on my side of the spectrum, Th just so you know. <laughs> Fun fact, separate from this story, Lara Logan got likes and retweets from literal Kremlin officials on Twitter last yep. week when she explained how Ukrainian battalions are using Nazi demon magic on the battlefield. <laughs> so I'm just saying she was hired by someone to come up with that. Theory, oh, you're right. right? Like, isn't Ooh. just yeah. check Downing Street. Or something. <laughs> so there you have it, folks. Darwin was paid off by the wealthy Jewish elite to make up evolution. And considering that it went on to be the backbone of modern biology, it has been confirmed by every legitimate scientific inquiry that's ever looked into it. They're clearly paying off all the other biologists as well. Sure. And if you think that's a prohibitive price tag, just imagine what they had to pay those finches. Because like, <laughs> here's the key. If you could produce a goddamn contract to come up with a theory of human origins that disproved the Bible and was signed by Charles Darwin and all the living Jews of the time, <laughs> that would not change the fact that it was correct. 
No, it would not. <laughs> right? It would mean that we owed a huge debt of thanks to the international Zionist cabal. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. They do a lot of good stuff, it seems like, right? <laughs> Damn, right after Hallmark canceled their baby blood themed line, too. Oh, now Jesus I. Uh, <laughs> did we get him one of the purple ones? <laughs> I'd say purple. No. And finally, tonight, we're going to close it out with something very serious, actually. I'd like to give my very important take about what happened at the Oscars on Sunday. And I feel like everyone got this wrong, except me. I got it right. Don't Look Up was obviously best picture. Coda? Are you fucking, <laughs> fuck you. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. What? Now, granted, Don't Look Up was the only nominee that I've seen out of oh, the okay. whole group. Oh, okay. All right, that makes sense. <laughs> but I'm doing a hot take, and that's how it works now, everybody. That's how it works. And I stand with you, Heath. And scene. Okay, here's <laughs> the actual final story, and it's delightful. Professional white guy Jordan Peterson said that Antifa kills people as revenge against God. And then he wept. Yeah. A lot. Mm. I already like Antifa. You don't have to sell them to me, buddy. <laughs> I, you're fine. So if you're not familiar with Jordan Peterson, he's kind of like Canadian Ben Shapiro, but just older. Uh, and if you're not familiar with Ben Shapiro, congrats, by the way. Uh, he's the... <laughs> Antidote for vaginal moisture. Yes, That's fun. His apparently. wife explained mm -hmm. how that works to him. Yes, and they're both alt-right piece of shit commentators. Peterson used to have other jobs, but now it's just just the podcasting. And that's fucking embarrassing. For <laughs> <laughs> he has a PhD from McGill University and decades of experience teaching in the psychology department at both Harvard and the University of Toronto. But in terms of getting paid to be a professor, he's getting beat by Eli Bosnick right now. Yes, he is. By a factor of infinity. He rage, quit, resign, retired in January from the University of Toronto. The big problem for him was the persecution of cishet white men mm -hmm. in academia. Uh, or maybe it was everyone hating him in all of Toronto and the world for being a bigot who refused to use desired pronouns in his class. Either way, now he does a podcast and a YouTube channel, and he gives lectures about the Bible and how the Bible gives us lessons in very important psychology and behavior that we need in order to have a stable society. That's his theory. Also, he looks like he's dying of a curse all the time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Which makes sense because he looks like an Indiana Jones bad guy, right? <laughs> so to be clear, he's doing the occupational equivalent of mumbling under his breath that he actually wanted to be in his room anyway. Mom. Yeah. <laughs> also, just sorry, I have to throw this out there. He got addicted to pain pills and then almost accidentally killed himself with his daughter's dumbass all meat diet. Yes. Uh -huh. what? what I'm saying is every time Jordan Peterson's name has popped up on my Google results for the last three years, it has been awesome. It's been <laughs> awesome for me. Jesus, it's so rough. It's the I guess the meat is the curse. It's like the fucking picture of Dorian <laughs> Gray, but it's him and the painting looks great. Or so I don't know. <laughs> It's just like a really sexy That's just paintings. How paintings yeah. work. The painting yeah. just keeps looking better. And he's like, yeah. fuck, did I backwards it? Damn it. Yeah. yeah. So there's one other character in the story we should meet. It's Andy No. Some of you know him. Some of you don't. If you don't, he's an alt-right piece of shit commentator. He's probably best known for covering protests in Portland, Oregon, and getting very conveniently beat up by... Antifa commando ninjas right before he turns his camera on oh. and then we get to see him all beat up. It's very sad for him. Antifa's like Michigan J. Frog apparently when Andy knows around. I don't know. And thanks to an anti-fascist who went undercover with some hate groups, we learned that Andy No has a very friendly business relationship with Christian right hate groups like the Proud Boys, for example. So naturally, Andy No was the perfect person for Jordan Peterson to interview this week. And during their talk together, Andy No asked Peterson to explain the psychology behind Antifa and why they're so evil. Peterson responded, quote, I think it's revenge against God for the crime of being. And what? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's correct. Even Andy No was like, what? There's a big pause while Andy No just stares into the camera with no idea what the fuck is happening. And yeah, neither do I. Right. Yeah, no, that's Atheist's main problem with God, guys. He's too extant. That's the good we complain <laughs> about that. Whenever Jordan Peterson speaks, I feel like he watched a dubbed anime for 11 seconds and was like, yep, gonna talk like that forever now. That's my <laughs> philosophy. <laughs> okay, that's what 
Jordan Peterson sounds like. That's Spirit not an exaggeration. That's like an accurate like one. Like a chicken man, yes. So, <laughs> so we get that, <laughs> we get that really awkward long pause. And then Peterson realizes, all right, I have to say more words because that was insane. Obviously, Andy <laughs> knows just staring at me. So he keeps going. He says, I, it's Cain and Abel. Oh, Abel's your guy, God? How about I take him out in the field and beat him to death? How do you feel about that, God? And okay, I don't know what that means either. But that's when Jordan Peterson also is like, I don't know what that means either. And I said it. And he starts just thinking about his own life. And he gets really sad. And he gets he gets the like the flutter thing to like. <laughs> and he like uh, the, the waggle on the lip. And uh -huh. he forgets the conversation completely. And he just starts lamenting about his sad life into the distance. <laughs> he continues talking, though. And he says, all my sacrifices went unrewarded. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it is. The bottom of the hell of things. <laughs> End quote. And then he definitely starts crying. And then he starts to cry. Weep. Okay, I hate to back up from the crying. I'd like to live there longer. But is he saying that <laughs> God's guy is fascism? <laughs> yeah. Right. I, I mean, I'm not saying he's wrong. I just it's not a thing that they would normally admit. Okay, <laughs> let, let me give you this hot take. I think Jordan Peterson might literally have burned his best lamb and be mad about it. Right? This is Jordan Peterson we're talking <laughs> okay. about here. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, moral of the story, don't look up was robbed. They were yes. robbed. Turn off the Oscars right then and there, whatever. That was the rest was probably boring anyway, nothing happened. <laughs> And while we, too, shed a tear for how bad Jordan Peterson's answer was, we're going to close the headlines for the night. Heath, Eli, thanks as always. Jumanji. And when we come back, we'll be reminded that Don does more than just weird commercials. No, you can get the little blowtorch at like Williams Sonoma mm -hmm. and give it a burned crust. You know what I'm saying? Yep. On a on a pizza bagel? Yes, on a pizza bagel. Take it seriously. Oh. Okay, guys, you ready for the third ad? I, I assume Eli wrote this one. Nope. Well, I didn't write it. I wrote it. Neither did I. I didn't yeah, I didn't you... I, look. We have to advertise the live show in Toronto on May seventh. So, I, does somebody want to write something up real quick? Oh, I have something. But you said you didn't write it. Oh, no, I didn't. See, since we're just letting people write things for our show now, I shot a text over to our good friend Thomas Smith over at the Opening Arguments podcast, and he wrote the last ad for us, Noah. But absolutely not. Mm, sorry, Noah, it's all we have. And he did write it just for you. Fine. Whatever, it's just one ad. Hi, podcast listener. That was very original, stealing our greeting. It's me, No Illusions. They, they know who I am. They're listening to the show. Thomas. Maybe without the commentary, fine, Noah? Fine, fine. First of all, let me say that my appreciation for retro gaming is far inferior to Thomas's. What? He has like a Super Nintendo. Noah. Fine, fine. We'll be in Toronto on May 7th doing God Awful Movies Live. You can buy tickets at godawfulmoviesalive.com. And don't forget our Platinum Night where you can get all our merch, dinner, and drinks on us, as well as a game night, which probably won't include code names because I'm not nearly as good as Thomas Smith is. Okay, that's it. Absolutely not. Where is my phone? GodawfulMoviesLive.com. Toronto, May 7th. Come check it out. Did Thomas actually write that? Or <laughs> No, I wrote it. Uh -huh. Now listen here, you nice. footless motherfucker. Okay, I feel like the ads kind of got away from us this week. Yep. A little bit. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. They totally did. Oh, don't play dumb with me. I will code names you to death, you fourth generation and up owning motherfucker. No, the joke was that I was better at sword fighting than you. That's not a joke, Keith. That's I laughed. Okay, but still, you understand hey, that guys, that's not... Guys, are you ready to do Bible Peace Theater? Yep. Yes. Uh, where were we? Well, I I'm still here, by the way. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, Don, we know that. Hi, Don. Okay, hi. You're still here. As I was saying, we left off with Elisha demonstrating his incredibly random powers, and he's just going to do that some more now. Ooh, I hope he makes another axe head float. Uh, we should be so lucky. But this first story is about an attack from the Syrians. Servant, servant, come here. Yes, king of Syria. The Jews totally knew we were coming with our surprise attack just now. I, it's, I, it's, 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 what are you guys spying? Have you, have, 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 you have to tell me if you've been spying. It's like being a cop. 
No, king of Syria, the Israelites have the prophet Elisha on their side, and he's the one helping them out. Oh, oh, okay, so, so, so let's go kill that Elisha guy, right? I mean, he does appear to have God powers, sir, and literally everyone else who has tried to kill him has died. I'm feeling lucky. I think we're going to be the ones that crack this nut. Uh, you think so, sir? Yeah, but no, I've got a good feeling about it. Ah, yes, your majesty, of course. Elisha! Elisha, come out! We have you surrounded! Uh, God, a little help here? Maybe, uh, blinding or something, please? Oh my god, I'm blind! Oh, me too, sir! We all are! <laughs> hey, how's it going? You guys need any help? Did you get blinded or something? Wait, who, who, who are you? Oh, me? My name is E. Pla. Your name is E. Pla. E. Pla. Yep, that is the noise I made for my name. Oh, that's, that's fine. That's fine. Could you just take us to Elijah? He, he's been sabotaging our attacks on Israel with his uh, his God powers. Oh, for sure, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Just follow me. Um, I will not lead you to Samaria. That's that's a weird thing to say. Hey, who do you want to believe? Yourselves or Eba? I thought you said your name was Impla. Y- yep. Yes, that that's my name. Also, it's... So let me get this straight. Your name is Impla Eba. Impla Eba. Yep. Yes. It's uh, French origin. France doesn't exist yet. Let's just get going. Almost there. Almost there. Super close to Elisha now. And C. I can see again. Me too. Wait a second. This isn't where Elisha lives. This is this is Samaria. That's right. It is. You just got Elisha. Boom, baby. Elisha face. So, so are you, what now? Are you gonna like kill us with your god powers? Or? Oh, uh, no, no, I wasn't planning on it. All right then. Um, so, what do we do? Ah, uh, have a little dinner. There's a great Thai place right around the corner. Ooh, I love Thai Wait, food. I'm, so, I'm sorry, hold on a second. You blinded us with your god powers and let us here just to eat dinner and go home? Yeah, I guess. I mean, are you lobbying for me to kill you guys? I'm confused no, by what's no, happening right no, now. No, it, no, it's fine. I'm just, it's just, it's just odd. I, I'm more of a quantity, not quality type prophet. Seems like uh, it. I suppose so. Okay. Say, say uh, while we're here, you guys want to, like, siege these lands? They seem nice, right? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Okay. That sounds reasonable. Sorry, was that a yes to the Thai food? Because now I am, like, craving Masaman. Yeah, I could do Thai. Uh, yeah, yeah, I suppose Thai's fine. Is it going to be weird if I join you guys for Thai? Yeah. I mean, kind of. Nice. Cool. Wait, is it, are you saying yes, it would be? Yeah, okay. So the Syrians sieged Samaria, and a terrible famine came over the land as a result. It was so bad that a donkey's head sold for 80 pieces of silver, and a bit of dove shit cost five pieces of silver. I'm sorry, what? That, that's, that's what the Bible says, man. Were people eating dove shit? And famine somehow drove up the prices of it? I, that's what the Bible says, yeah. Blind to me. Okay, sorry. So just to be clear, this book has dove shit pricing complaints, but not a part where it says that rape is bad. That, uh, yes, that is correct. Okay, how much should dove shit cost? What it's, do you I'm, think that would Obviously be? less than five pieces of silver. Lulu, Lou, I'm the king of Israel walking along the wall of Samaria. Hey, hey, fucking king of fucking Israel! Oh, oh, hello. Oh, Cecil, what are you doing here? Wait, what What are you doing here? Eli told me you were hurt. Okay, to be fair, he was. Thomas made him say he was bad at code names. It's true, he did. Damn it, Eli, I rescheduled a work call for this, man. Yes, you did, but since you're here... Fine, fine. Anyway, can I help you? Yeah, I need your fucking help. Ah, uh, sure, what seems to be the problem? Well, you see, it's this fucking bitch right fucking here. Don't you fucking call me a fucking bitch, I'll fucking bitch. Call you're a fucking, you a bitch. fucking bitch if I want you're to call a you a fucking You're a fucking bitch. Fucking Don't fucking hate you. start with me. You are. Da, you are. Anyway, yesterday's, I was so fucking hungry that she comes to my studio and she says to me, let's eat your fucking kid today. Here we go. So we can eat my fucking kid tomorrow. So we fucking boils my fucking kids. And then she 
eats them, and I eat them, and then, and then I come to her house today to eat her fucking kid, and she's hiding them like fucking Celtics tickets. Fuck you. I never Fuck say you, you can eat my fucking baby. I never said that. Wow. That's severely messed up. Right? She should let me eat a fucking baby. Uh, no, no. Uh, I was talking about how you like the Celtics. You wanted to see me, King of Israel? Oh, right, yes, Elisha. Um, did you bring the Syrians to Samaria? Yeah, um, me and God did this whole blind Marco Polo thing on them. <laughs> it's actually pretty funny. Okay, um, I'm gonna stop you there. It's causing a big famine. Oh. People are eating babies. Dove shit is going through the roof, apparently. Oh, uh, prices probably went straight up. Yeah, so. I, yeah. <laughs> I guess what I'm saying is really for the first time in the whole book is that your God is doing a bad job and, and maybe, maybe we don't want to rely on him to fix our problems anymore. Wait, wait, wait come on. No, you don't need to do that. I'll fix everything. I got this tomorrow at this time, a measure of flour and two measures of barley will each cost one shekel guaranteed. I'm sorry, but that's actually physically impossible. Even if you just like filled the whole kingdom with barley. It will be, it will be, but you'll see, you'll see, Mr. Skeptic. I mean, what can I say? I just finished the grand unified theory of bullshit available now wherever fine books are sold. Huh? Huh, Cecil? That made it better. That doesn't, that doesn't make it better. Um, Cecil, I liked the audiobook. Dude, who the fuck are you? Okay, Elisha, it's about the time when you said everything should be fixed, right? Yep, yeah, yeah. just uh, one second. Hey, hey, fellow Syrians, I, I hear horse hoofs. Let's run away from the city and never come back. At least I can reduce my prices back to where they were. See, I told you guys. Hey, whatever happened to that skeptic guy? Oh, he got trampled by the Syrians for questioning me. So, you know, that's what happens. Oh, does your god ever do stuff that doesn't have massive death tolls? He does not so far, no. Okay, right, got it. Hazael, most loyal servant. Yes, master, my king of Syria. Yikes! Wow, you are, um... You know what, it's fine, it's fine. Would you go to Elisha and ask him if, uh, if I'm going to get better? Bring him a gift, too, maybe? Of course, as you wish, master. And try to talk normal when you see a, a lice. Ah, uh, he's gone. And that's why I brought you these gifts. So, what do you say? Um, yeah, he's, he's going to get better. Uh, all better, absolutely. Oh, good, good, very good. I'm sorry, <laughs> he's, he's not going to get better. You're going to murder him and burn the cities and uh, rip the pregnant ladies apart because... You are, uh, you're just like, yikes. What? No, I'm, I'm not going to do any of you, that. You are going to do that, man. I, I am not, um, just pregnant ladies. Are, sorry, are you writing that down? Um, no. You're like, you have a pen. Ah, Hazel, you have returned. What did Elisha say? Oh, master. He said you're going to get all better. Oh, great. Is that, um, is that a hot towel? Or, uh, yes. Here, let me help you with it. Smother, smother, oh, smother, oh, smother. Oh, Dude, can I say you're just the most predictable murderer ever? Uh, no, I'm not. Smother, smother, smother. Oh, let's see. Guy is king, guy dies, guy is king, guy dies. Oh, here we go, here we go. The story of Jehu. I actually think it's pronounced Jew. No, 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 no they're, they're Je all Je Jehu. He's the the king who finally gave the. Uh, he's going to avenge the prophet that Jezebel murdered. Wow, that was like four hundred pages ago. Oh, I'm sorry, Eli. Is something hard to remember when it happened a couple months since you last visited it? Oh well, maybe if you listened to D and D minus, you'd be caught up. No oh yeah, illusion. no. Then I'd only be three months behind. Anna takes notes. Anna takes notes. Guys, guys, guys. Do you want me to take over as dungeon master? Because I oh no, that's a nice. Idea. Don would let me have a I, bonus action. You know, I will kill all of you with a sword. He has a lot more experience, I think. Mm. Psst. Psst. Hey, hey, hi, Elijah. H how's it going, man? Uh, awesome, really good, really good. Uh, listen, you gotta anoint Jehu. 
the king? Yeah, but like as a prank. So take this box full of oil and, and go, uh, okay. go do that. This feels like a bad container for oil. Uh, okay, I was out of vases. Yes, it is. It, I, in retrospect, this is a bad container. And so what you got to do, you dump it on Jehu's head and tell him like, boom, you're anointed. You got to go kill Jezebel and her family and everyone that pees on a wall. That's such a bad way of saying men. Are you going to do it or not? I, I don't know. Is God going to kill me if I say no? I, I mean, probably, statistically. And fi- yes, then I'm in. Lou, 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 do a Jehu stuff. Jehu stuff is my favorite stuff. Anointed! You're, you're anointed now. Dude, seriously, this is a new tunic. You gotta go kill Jezebel and her family now. What? Why? I don't know, man. She killed my family or something. It's hard to follow. Unlike the adventures of D&D Minus, which people should really give a shot, even if you're not into D&D. Thomas Smith likes it. He told me. Uh, all right, all right, all right, fine. I will go kill those people. Sorry, did you have that oil in a box? He was out of aces. Jehu, it is I, Joram. Why have you come to my town? Is it in peace? Your mother's a whore and a witch. (laughs) Okay, so... No, then. Right. Hey, Jezebel. Oh, hello. I killed Joram and Ahaziah. Oh, you did? That's... That's lame. Do you, do you have any eunuchs up there with you? Yeah. That floor? Yeah, we do. Hey, eunuchs! Uh-huh. You, you might just toss her down here. I'm doing a revenge thing. You got it! Sure thing! Seriously, guys? This is this is really lame. Oh, sorry, Jezebel, but considering you're a lady in the Bible, you did pretty good. You lasted a long time. No, man. no, that's fair. That, that's fair. And then uh, Jehu ran her over with horses until there was nothing left but her skull and her feet and her hands. Is, is that the end of the story? Uh, yep. Wow. This book, this book just really, really sucks. Say that again, man. Cecil, you're still here? Yeah, I took the afternoon off work because Eli said it was an emergency. Also, whoever left Thai food in the fridge, I, I, I ate it. Uh, it, it, was, it was mine, Cecil. Nice. Thanks, Ron. It's Don. You say so. Will this result in an epic fistfight? Will Eli create a Cecil v. Don through line that'll confuse new listeners for years to come? Was that ever in any doubt? Find out the answers on the next installment of Bible Peace Theater. Before we cue the theme song tonight, I want to remind you that Andrew, Eli, Heath, and I are hosting a charity game night at American Atheists Convention in Atlanta on Easter weekend. It's Thursday night before the convention starts, so it's a great way to meet people you can share the con with. There's going to be board games. There's going to be pub-style trivia. Plus, all the proceeds go to Access Reproductive Care Southeast. It's a charity that helps women in the Southeast access safe and compassionate reproductive care, including abortion services. Their work has never been more important. Check the show notes for more details on the convention, and we really hope to see you there. Anyway, that's all the blast movie we've got for you tonight. We'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for a brand new episode of our sister show's Hot Friend God Awful Movies, debuting at 7 and Eastern on Tuesday, and an even newer episode of our half-sister show citation needed, debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, this show wouldn't stick together if I neglected to thank Heath Enright for this, Eli Bosnick for that, and Lucinda Delusions for the other thing. also want to thank Don Ford for being built Ford Tough. I want to thank Quinn for providing this week's Farnsworth quote, and be sure to check out the show notes if you are discordant and want to chat with some fellow listeners and atheists. But most of all, of course, I want to thank this week's most memorable mammals, Amanda Burns, Art, Michael, Mitch, Derpity, David, Cinco Boy 42, Alicia, Rosemary, and Dawn. Amanda, Michael, and Mitch, who are hotter than the rating on the Parker Solar Probe's heat shield. Derpity, David, and Cinco Boy, who are so bright their cameras needed an unflash. And Alicia, Rosemary, and Dawn, whose IQs are so high I have to modulate the pitch of my voice upward just to disgust them. Together, these nine notable non-believers nudge our net worths northward this week by giving us money. Not everybody has the money it takes to give some to us, but if you do, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash scathingatheist, whereby you'll earn early access to an extended ad-free version of every episode, or you can make a one-time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingatheist.com. And if you'd like to help, but not in a money kind of way, you can also help a ton by leaving a five-star review, telling a friend about the show, or following at PIATPod on Twitter. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robson handles our social media, and our audio engineers are Morgan Clark, who also wrote all the music that was used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingadius.com. How
can we blame this dub shit cost on Biden? That's what I'm asking. <laughs> mm. <laughs> mm. I did that. A little pigeon shit, yeah. Thanks, Obama. A little meme. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2022. All rights reserved.